that when 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 studies have <laughs> when studies have looked at the treatment gap, they look at, you know, did you receive treatment or not, right? They're epidemiologic studies. And this is kind of a monolithic approach to uh, to, access, to to care. And they don't really capture kind of nuances about, did someone get appropriate care? Did they get adequate care? So one solution to the gap, the mental health treatment gap, that's great, gained a lot of attention by healthcare systems, policymakers, World Health Organization, really over 15 years, is the integration of mental health and physical health care services. So this increases access to care literally by bringing services into settings where people are already coming for their medical care. So there's a strong rationale um, for integrating mental health services into what I call physical disease programs, or what World Health Organization calls physical disease programs. And by this, I mean HIV care and treatment settings, NCD care settings, diabetes clinics, because this approach, it's, you're not only bringing the services in, and so now they're available, they're conveniently available, but you're leveraging infrastructure that's already in place for management of chronic diseases, right? So everywhere, even in very low resource settings, there's kind of regular appointments and follow-up monitoring staff workflows. So all of this can be leveraged to also treat mental disorders as a chronic condition. And, and WHO specifically, you know, explicitly recognized this in the Mental Health Action Plan in 2019. They list five priority NCDs in the world and mental disorders are one of the five priority NCDs, right? So we know that integrated care, and this, and this is based largely on all of the evidence that integrating care can improve mental health outcomes, functioning, satisfaction with care, right? And so that, and there's tremendous potential in low resource settings because you're leveraging this existing system and you're not reliant on a separate specialty system that is, is underfunded. Right, so the integrated care improves outcomes, recommendations to address them. But over the last year or two, there's actually, um, policymakers have gone beyond just this general recommendation. There are now specific targets for integration. And I, th I think these are really important for us to, to pay attention to. So for example, UNAIDS in their report for 2021 to 2026 specifies that by 2025, 90% of people living with HIV should be linked to person-centered services for HIV, NCDs, and mental disorders. So I think we got a long way to go in a lot of places to kind of meet those metrics. So just a, a quick word about the rationale again for, for thinking about physical disease programs is that, that mental disorders are just more highly prevalent among people with chronic diseases. And when we think about multimorbidity, right, this is the co-occurrence of two or more chronic diseases in a single individual. Um, more about 40% of the US population has um, multiple chronic conditions and, and half of the world population over 60. So this too uh, associated with increased mortality, increased morbidity. What we see in the figure on the right is that the risk of having a mental a comorbid mental disorder increases with the number of chronic medical conditions that you have. So, um, you know, despite the prevalence of multimorbidity, right, the recognition that this is a, a major problem, a public health problem, clinical guidelines and care models still kind of focus on one disorder. And that's really not <laughs> very helpful for people in practice who are trying to see the person in front of them, right? They've got multiple things they're dealing with. So I, you know, what I want to start with is just the idea that our integrated care models really have the potential to treat multiple disorders. And I want to first to start, I've been talking about integrated care and to define what what uh, what what I mean by integrated care, because there are a range of disorders. And I think this, it's kind of a generic term. Um, there's been sort of lack of consistent definitions, but the, the reality is that um, there are a number of different integrated care models. And I, what I wanna to talk today about is the collaborative care model. And I'm, I'm kind of putting it in the context of other successful and effective integrated care models. So um, there was a really um, a kind of interesting and important systematic review and meta-analysis that Leo uh, Cabillos and colleagues published a couple of years ago, looking at effective models for treatment of depression in low and middle income countries. And they, the, the paper included this um, kind of categorization of how we might think about integrated care. And the bullet points kind of list what are strategies that have been Try, you know, been successful, have improved outcomes um, by different groups kind of over the years in integrating care into physical health care settings. And one, one important thing I want to recognize are sort of 
organized according to increasing complexity and resource intensiveness. But one thing I want to recognize is that that the most resource uh, intensive and complex models are not going to fit in all settings. And so I think you know, a key recommendation as we think about sort of starting to implement is for a system to think about their infrastructure, their capacity, you know, what, what can you do with the resources that you have available? But, but with that being said, to just kind of think about general strategies, right? You can kind of come into a setting where there's just a physician or maybe not even a physician, kind of a nurse providing primary care um, and, and provide general training. And that might increase identification of mental disorders, but it's not likely to improve any outcomes, right? There's no treatment. You're just kind of, this is depression. It's, it's associated with morbidity and mortality. But then we think about sort of access, formal access to a consultant. And this is our consultation liaison model. The, the, the primary care provider can pick up a phone, talk to a psychiatrist about an individual case. And obviously this is important to many of us in the department is the work that we do, and we're still doing it in the department. There's the e-consult service, there's the PCL line for all of Washington state providers. So this is very helpful for individual cases. But as we move to kind of increasing sort of complexity and resource needs, you think about dedicated staff being on site delivering psychological interventions. Again, vast literature, 20 years of work, a lot of different people, staff can be trained to do a lot of different psychological interventions. Very helpful um, to, it can improve uh, mental health outcomes. But there's a big jump when we think about stepped care models. This is an important kind of innovation that Bikram Patel and others kind of developed or was developed even in the, um, uh, you know, some, some clinical trials kind of looking at treatment of depression. The, the idea is that there's a structured approach that's driven by data. You start your care for depression, for example, with a low intensity intervention and then monitor treatment over time. And you're intensifying treatment based on how someone's responding. This is an incredibly efficient way to use limited resources. Um, and then, so collaborative care in this context is an example of a stepped care model, right? It, it definitely employs this idea of sort of a stepped care approach. And what's different, what distinguishes collaborative care from other stepped care models is that, firstly, that the care is delivered by a team. It's not a single therapist interacting one-on-one -on -one with the patient or the group. It's a team-based approach. There's a dedicated care manager who not only provides, typically provides the behavioral intervention, but also is responsible for kind of program management. And then critically, there's this view of a population. It's not just how is care going for our individual patients, it's how are, um, um, how are things going for a caseload of patients or uh, even the population as a whole, people might need treatment. So collaborative care, <clears throat> this collaborative care model is based on the chronic care model. It's a team-based approach, very data-driven. It has the a potential to improve not just mental health, health outcomes like other integrated mental health interventions, but also medical outcomes. And I think it's really, um, it's sort of a landmark trial was Wayne Caton's team care trial, which was a randomized trial in 14 primary care clinics in Washington that evaluated a 12 month collaborative care intervention for treatment of diabetes and depression. So this was the same, it's kind of the same core components of all collaborative care models, but it's sort of this and diabetes, right? So you had um, the team was a, a new care manager and a consultant psychiatrist, and there was a di consulting diabetes specialist. Population management, evidence-based treatment, measurement-based care was all for depression and diabetes. And it, you know, it worked. It was um, participants who received team care were significantly more likely to experience clinical improvement in depression and diabetes in the 12-month intervention. So, you know, there's been a hundred, I don't know how many RCTs that demonstrate the effectiveness of collaborative, of collaborative care for improving mental health outcomes. A lot of this work's been done by, by Joe, by, you know, Jurgen, people, a lot of people in our department have done these trials of putting collaborative care in a range of settings to treat a range of disorders, a range of populations um, to improve mental health outcomes. Um, but we wanted to look at can collaborative care, can this, this special form of collaborative care that Wayne developed that approaches multiple conditions, can that actually work elsewhere? Can that, can that improve medical outcomes? We're you know, very confident it can improve mental health outcomes, but can it improve medical outcomes? So I wanna share experiences with, again, two very different adaptations of this model or the components of this model and what we've learned about it. So the first is a, a multi-center uh, trial in diabetes clinics in India to treat diabetes and depression. And the second is our work in low barrier HIV clinics in Seattle and where, where we're treating HIV, depression and opioid use disorder. 
So the independent trial, Integrating Care for Diabetes and Depression in India, was um, uh, you know, kind of an adaptation of the team care model. Um, it was a wonderful collaboration between with colleagues from the Global Diabetes Research Center at Emory and the Madras Diabetes Research Foundation in Chennai. And I want to share, I, I want to focus on what we learned in the process evaluation and what we learned about implementation in the context of this clinical trial. But I have to share the effectiveness of the multi-component model because, because Bobby's here <laughs> and because this was the first model, I think uh, still the only model that improved both uh, that improves both mental health and medical outcomes uh, in a low and middle income country. So it was a type one hybrid effectiveness imp implementation trial. It was at four um, diabetes clinics in kind of throughout India. Um, and we evaluated the sustained effectiveness of a 12 month collaborative care intervention to treat diabetes and depression. So what's, what's interesting about our primary outcome was it was both a composite of depression and cardiometabolic indicators. And we didn't measure it at the end of the 12 month intervention, we, we measured it at the a 24 month intervention. Um, so there were two, two aims. The first was to actually tailor our intervention because we're bringing it now from group health clinics um, to uh, specialty diabetes clinics in India. So we had to tailor it for the Indian cultural context and also for just the practice of depression, uh, that practice of care for diabetes in, in Indian clinics. So this was done through qualitative work uh, at three of the sites. Um, and then we did the trial, which again was a uh, randomized trial. And the primary outcome, just to be clear, was we were looking at, we had intervention compared to uh, enhanced usual care. And we were looking at the percentage in both groups that achieved both a clinically significant depression response and a clinically significant response in diabetes care. The intervention was kind of Wayne's team care model on the left. Again, all of the components, it's depression and diabetes. Um, and then, but we augmented it with a really interesting QI strategy that our colleagues from Emory had developed in a, in, in a large clinical trial in primary care clinics. They were looking at improving the care of diabetes um, in, in primary care in India and Pakistan. And it was about 1,100 people in the trial. And the, the intervention was this decision support software. So it was in the EMR and physicians would look at it when they would see a patient and it would prompt them to, to make changes based on a treatment algorithm. So we updated that treatment algorithm. We developed a treatment algorithm for antidepressant medications um, and that was the intervention. But so we had to, you know, we spent the first year of the trial kind of adapting it for the new context. And this was done, this was work that was led by our wonderful colleague at UW, Deepa Rao, um, kind of looking at take, getting stakeholder perspectives to think about what, um, how, how does the intervention need to be different to be relevant to people in India who have diabetes and depression? And so at three of the sites, we uh, the team interviewed uh, people with poorly controlled diabetes and depression, family members, clinical staff, um, and, and basically four themes emerged. There was recognition of the importance of family members in that management of diabetes and support of care so that we really had to explicitly in incorporate fam families into the the second was that there was a need for clear and simple information for patients and families, that there was a lot of jargon in our materials, medical technique, people just between levels of illiteracy and health illiteracy, really the, the materials were too complex. Um, and then there was this important recognition of stigma, that this was a huge barrier um, around both diabetes and depression, and the, the importance of of the intervention, the care coordinators acknowledging this, kind of thinking about how this impacts treatment, even developing strategies to help people kind of manage the impact of stigma. And then a lot of positive feedback about the intervention. People loved the idea that they could come to the diabetes clinic, get depression care, that they could meet with a counselor in the clinic. There was a lot of kind of feedback about some of the specifics. Um, just a quick word about our care coordinators. This was one change from the U.S. model. Uh, in, the U in, in Wayne's U.S. model, they use nurses in the group health clinics. Um, there aren't typically nurses in outpatient clinics in India, so we used um, the existing work staff who actually work in the diabetes clinic and provide counseling and education. So these are allied health professionals, um, and they are uh, kind of the equivalent of like nutritionists in, in our clinics. And then the training kind of followed um, sort of the AIM Center longitudinal training. There was a real focus on kind of in-person, very interactive skills that care coordinators were trained in behavioral activation, MI, 
Um, and they, uh, there's a lot of kind of focus on each individual, training the team together. And then we had longitudinal training. This was actually a really fun part of the trial. We had kind of over time, every month we had these care coordinator calls to kind of provide didactics. It was basically to reinforce their skills, but to provide didactics, give them an opportunity to talk about cases. So, so Deepa, who's a psychologist, and I, and one of the original team care nurses, Sue, did the um, uh, did these calls, and then we also provided support. I provided support to the psychiatrist on quarterly basis. The RCT was pretty straightforward. People came to clinic; they were recognized as having poorly controlled diabetes, screened for depression. If they had current depression, they were invited to participate. Randomized. Um, it basically just shows they were randomized to either the intervention or to enhanced usual care. Um, and uh, the, there were six month research visits for collection of research data and people, the end of the intervention was 12 months, primary outcome was 24 months. And the people who received uh, collaborative care received the, the care coordinator visits, the physicians had decision support prompts, there were caseload reviews every two weeks. Um, just kind of, you know, from our primary paper, it was, there were no differences between the group at baseline. It just to give you a sense of who, who was in the trial about 50 years old, mostly women, eight or so years of diabetes, about a third on insulin. Baseline PHQ-9 score was 13 and baseline A1C was nine in both groups. And then you can see that the systolic blood pressure, right? You, you could get into the trial with any one of these indicators being, being elevated. And there really wasn't much kind of elevation of blood pressure or LDL in the group, which I think we kind of see in the findings. So um, primary outcome, again, was this, what percentage of the group had a response to both depression and diabetes? And we see, you know, kind of importantly, um, this is kind of the groups, the control group, and then the comparison group, I mean, the intervention group on top. Our primary outcome, the groups were different. 72% of our collaborative care participants had both uh, response to in depression and diabetes compared to 55% of the control group. And when we look at the trajectory, we see that the groups moved apart at six months. The difference was greatest at the end of the intervention, but it was sustained at 24 months, which was our primary outcome. When we look at kind of individual disease outcomes, this is the, the graph on the left is the one I just showed you, our composite outcome. It, it looks like that was really driven by a response in depression because this is the graph on the right is the depression change, the difference in a group in, in kind of clinically significant depression change over time. And you can see just a very similar shape of the graph, very similar numbers in response. So again, depression was also a sustained difference. But yeah, kind of a different outcome, uh, different picture for the medical outcomes though. This is the A1C over time. And you can see here that um, the groups, again, the collaborative care group is on top and the control group is on the bottom, that we can see that uh, the groups moved apart at six months, they were different at six months, they were different at the end of the intervention, right? It was a, a statistically significant improvement in A1C at the end of the intervention. But when we look over time after the intervention ended, this is, we see that there's no longer a difference at the, the 24 month time point. And then the groups were not, there was not kind of a difference at any time point in blood pressure or LDL, probably because there was you know, kind of a ceiling effect. Um, just, I, I'll, I'll quickly go through sort of in the interest of time where our primary endpoint was 24 months, but we had the opportunity to collect 36 month follow-up data. So we were kind of interested, right? I mean, they've had improvement in depression and improvement in the composite scores. What happens 12 months later? So we had 331 uh, patients who had 36 month data. And um, this actually, there was no, this is the SCL over time, right? So it's coming down um, better for the, the, um, better for the intervention group on the bottom. They had lower scores, different at 24 months, but they came together at 36 months. So there was no difference in the composite score in any of the individual scores kind of at 36 months um, between the groups. But one of the interesting things that Cara Suvada from, from Emory found was that the collaborative care participants, when we looked at people who had a response at 12 months, um, the groups who, the collaborative care participants were more likely to maintain their depression improvement um, and, or their uh, A1C improvement at 36 months. And, you know, pretty significant, um, pretty robust uh, risk ratios. So, so kind of good news about sort of maintenance of response at 36 months. Um, one final kind of post hoc analysis is that we, uh, Chris Kemp from our group kind of looked at 
what was the effect on anxiety, right? This wasn't an intervention to treat anxiety, a lot of comorbidity between depression and anxiety. Could this be helpful? Could this, it, it kind of increases the clinical relevance if it is also helpful for anxiety. So there were 172 participants who had a, an elevated GAD at baseline. And what we found, the table is sort of showing the difference between the groups who had clinically significant reduction in anxiety symptoms at each of the time points. And so we see during the trial, six months, 12 months, this is the end of the interview, and these groups are different, um, but that this difference did not was not sustained the way the depression group was sustained. And interestingly, Chris looked at, um, we thought that maybe the people who responded were the people who had received antidepressant medications, and it, it didn't actually appear that that was the case. So just a quick summary of like mental health effectiveness of the model for improved depression outcomes at 12 months, sustained, improved diabetes outcomes at 12 months, not sustained, evidence that it helps people who do respond maintain their response at 36 months. So I want to shift gears and spend a few minutes talking about our process evaluation. This is really sort of gets into our sort of understanding of how the intervention worked, why it worked, who it might work better for. Um, and we did this through a comparative case study at two of the four sites, and it was informed by this, uh, something called the realist evaluation framework that emphasizes context, right? It's the idea that an intervention isn't the same for everyone everywhere. Um, so it was a mixed methods approach that was embedded in the trial. Again, it was a comparative case study at two of the four sites. That was just a cost reason. We couldn't do all four sites. Um, but we chose the two sites because they really were very different from each other. They were different in important ways. One was in the northern part of the country, another in the south, lots of cultural language differences. The study in the uh, organization in Delhi was a government public hospital. The uh, one in Chennai was private. Um, so, you know, kind of important sort of for implementation, looking at sort of these different organizations. And we went through, we had two primary aims of the process evaluation. We wanted to kind of go back and look at Deepa's work around how should this model have been adapted? You know, did that actually happen, right? Did, did, was there evidence from, um, from talking to care coordinators and patients who'd received the intervention? Did, they, did it seem like we successfully incorporated the adaptations? And then there was this, this uh, following the realist framework evaluation, a realist evaluation framework, it was um, to develop kind of a program theory. Why does the model work? Um, and test it against a lot of data. So this, this was wonderful work that Leslie Johnson from Emory, she spent a year between the two clinics kind of collecting clinic observations, it reviewed activity logs and the care coordinators, the software. I mean, it's unbelievable kind of the data she went through. She interviewed implementing physicians. So this was sort of an interesting part of the work. And, you know, kind of, it, there's a lot to say about this, but I think the important point is when we look at the adaptations during the implementation. So for this part, it was through in-depth interviews with the care coordinators at the site, and then a purpose of a sample of 62 patients who'd received the intervention. Some of them got better, some of them didn't. They, they were sort of, you know, a range, uh, like at a range of how engaged they were. Um, but what, what, what emerged from the qualitative data was that there were two reasons why the, uh, the teams and particularly the care coordinators made some changes in, in the, the how the, how the component, how the behavioral component in particular was operationalized. So we wanted to look at, you know, did we incorporate the changes that came from the formative work, engaging family members, employing patient-friendly language, thinking about stigma. And we can, we can see that um, the patients really expressed comfort. They really felt like the care coordinators did provide simple and clear explanations. Materials were translated into multiple languages. There was a real, there was a very high level of illiteracy in the participants. They really appreciated, there was a lot of visual materials, especially for dietary information. And then one particularly effective strategy, we had this decision support software that was provider facing. So the provider would open the chart and would see somebody's like, your A1C is red, you know, your blood pressure is yellow. And this red was a really, so the care coordinators would just share it with them, would just show it to the patients and it was really sort of a powerful visual image and red kind of motivated people to make some changes. Uh, one thing we didn't do so well was incorporate the some specific cultural values and particular kind of religious practices, but both positive and negative impact on depression and diabetes, and really thinking about kind of the more cultural components of um, 
you know, what it's like for somebody to come in and have di depression and diabetes care. And this, this was a, a wonderful thing that emerged during the trial because the care coordinator and the psychiatrist really sort of brought in their own practice in this and, and applied strategies for stress management and just other things that we had not put into the trial to kind of help support people. Um, in terms of improving engagement with care, uh, the care coordinators did effectively uh, engage family members. They did. They were very flexible. They did home visits. Um, but one thing they didn't, the one thing that they were surprised by um, was that health was often not the top priority for many patients. And this quote really illustrates sort of when people are living in poverty, that they just really have very real barriers to not only coming to care, but even self-care. And I think this was something that we had sort of not built in kind of effectively enough into how the care coordinators should approach that. Um, just a couple of comments about this, the process evaluation and the program theory. Um, this, is kind of, this is just an example of what the framework looks like, but it, it basically takes the perspective of implementation actors, right? What happens to actors? What are the challenges and solutions that arise during implementation? So we see the care coordinator as the main actor, other team members, the software was an actor, we have implementation activities. And I think the, the um, kind of long story short is that these are challenges um, that come up with a lot of, anytime there's sort of implementation of new programs, right? Hesitation about your new role. Um, the care coordinators in particular were really kind of overwhelmed that they were the only link between the psychiatrist and the patients. They were really worried about missing key information. So we had a lot, we built in a lot into the trial to support people, um, to support the care managers over time. But what was real, and, and that worked and they appreciated that, but what was really wonderful to see was how the teams responded and kind of pulled together and supported each other, right? So there's these things that organically grew up in the team. So one important contribution was the, the psychiatrists on the team. They were really, really invested in the team. So there were a lot of informal support strategies, you know, kind of guidance for the care coordinators. And then the care coordinators themselves really had a lot of peer support from each other. So we had been having these, these kind of ongoing longitudinal training sessions, but they started to really be a community. They, you know, they're all over the country, right? But they, they formed a WhatsApp group and they would just reach out to each other and check in with each other. What do you think about this? What do you, you know? Um, and similarly, the physicians, and these were not even primary care providers, they were kind of diabetes physicians. So they, at the beginning, were like, this is not what I do. I don't want to provide antidepressants. And, you know, similar to what we've seen in other settings, they picked up patterns. They saw recommendations. They sort of learned what the psychiatrist was recommending generalized into the next case. So I think just kind of emphasizing sort of early in the implementation experience, how, how the teams are, you know, kind of creatively problem solve for their own context. And I think this is true also for workflows. The teams, you know, there were supposed to be physician appointments and care coordinator appointments. How do you do that, right? Without decrease, increasing patient burden, people are traveling hours to their appointments. They're not gonna do that twice in a week. So. Um, and then also how they reach the psychiatrist outside between meetings. So this is just kind of the lessons learned from the process evaluation, both thinking about, you know, kind of adaptations, how were the intervention components operationalized during the implementation period? But then also recognizing the important, but also kind of what were the implementation challenges in this, in this early period? And so recognizing I kind of want to shift gears and recognizing the importance of these two issues for our future work. We, we looked beyond kind of independent, kind of thinking about what are core components? How do they get operationalized? How, how, have, how have others dealt with implementation challenges? So we wanted to kind of, kind of look at these two figures, these, these two issues. So the first, um, uh, we, we, when the, first, the first idea was to kind of look at what are key ingredients of effective, of other effective models. So we recently published a rapid review of collaborative care uh, in low and middle income countries, papers that were published between 10, 2010 and 2022. And this work was led by Jesse Whitfield in our department. And it was really kind of interesting to see, right? We were looking at studies, outpatient settings in low, you know, kind of in, in low and middle income countries defined by the World Bank. We were looking specifically at team-based interventions, treatment of adults, but for any MH gap priority condition. So we kind of, it wasn't just depression and anxiety. We were looking at substance use disorders, schizophrenia, uh, and epilepsy, which is an MH gap priority condition. 
And because we wanted to look at effective models, we um, we we want we only looked at at uh, at, at experimental. Oops, move along. We only looked at experimental or non-experimental studies that had clinical outcomes in a comparison group. And kind of long story short, what, what Jesse found was that there were 25 studies of 20 different models, collaborative care models, all over WHO regions, vast majority in primary care, majority uh, targeted depression or anxiety, but there were five studies that targeted schizophrenia. And when we looked at outcomes, they mostly used validated clinic rate, clinical rating scales for symptoms, but the schizophrenia studies tended to focus on functional outcomes. And so I wanted to highlight here just kind of what the components of the model are, because as we think about implementing, it's like, what are you going to implement, right? What should you actually be doing? So these are team models. They all had a care manager. Um, they all provided evidence-based treatment, all, specifically pharmacotherapy and psychoeducation. 16 of them had a specific brief psychological intervention. This was typically behavioral activation or problem-solving therapy. Population-based management, all it, it mo most involved screening. But what we saw, where we saw the greatest kind of variation was in um, the use of the kind of strategic use of measurement and the use of data. And that there were only, you know, only 11 used measurement-based care, fewer used treatment to target, and, and, and only two used registries in our study. <laughs> our study was one of them. So, um, so, you know, really kind of thinking about when you're saying you, this is the model, this is the effective model, like what do you actually need to do? I'll just say a couple of words about this before I turn to our work in King County, because um, we're just kind of talking with conversation with colleagues who are doing similar work. Um, this was kind of looking at our independent study along with the Hope study, which was a big uh, NIMH-funded cluster RCT in India, and then uh, Bibavacharya's work in Nepal <clears throat> in government hospitals in rural Nepal, really seeing that. A lot of common themes about implementation challenges. And we you know, published a paper where we organized these implementation challenges according to the WHO health systems framework and, and saw some major challenges with respect to workforce and service delivery. And the two points I want to make about one, one is about workforce that I, I feel like we've we as a collective kind of group of the research community have kind of addressed this shortage of, you know, we were very effective at leveraging care manager positions, if there aren't specialists, a whole range of staff can be trained to deliver interventions, um, but that there, we need to think about the supervision of staff. We need to tailor training and supervise staff. And when we think about workforce, to not forget that we need supervision as well. Um, and then the service delivery, I think, you know, as I kind of shift to talking about King County, we really need to think about these structural barriers to care and the, then the relevance of what we're doing to the population. The, you know, we, we're all about measurement, but if the scales aren't validated, if they're not acceptable to staff and patients, if the outcomes aren't important to people, these, these, uh, these uh, models are just not going to get implemented. So I want to share a little bit, uh, kind of bringing things a little closer to home to talk about how we've adapted this model and applied it in King County. Because um, there's a very compelling movement in global health to apply lessons learned in the global South to low resource settings in the US. This global to local approach has been done by Vikram Patel, you know, advocated by Vikram Patel and others. And it really makes a lot of sense. It kind of can address disparities in our settings here and kind of think about uh, increasing cultural responsiveness of both clinical practice and research. And I think what we want to do, what we want to show is that we can take these challenges to integrating care, what we've learned in India and Nepal, what people have learned in South Africa, elsewhere, apply it to low resource settings here because there are a lot of common challenges, right? A lot of comorbidity, a lot of competing demands due to poverty, stigma, structural barriers to care. So just, you know, kind of um, thinking about uh, where we're working in King County right now. And it, it, King County, like many places in the world, has implemented what's called differentiated service delivery for people living with HIV. And it's really, it aims to identify people who are not engaged in care, are not doing well, are not virally suppressed, and intensify treatment for them. It's like a stepped care approach to mental health that I was talking about earlier. Um, and this is a very efficient use of limited resources. So in King County, we have uh, achieved levels of viral suppression much higher than national averages. That's all great, but there's a substantial, kind of a sizable subgroup of people who are not engaged in traditional care. 
So in 2015, the Madison Clinic at Harborview and Public Health Seattle King County came together to create something called the MAX Clinic, which is the Maximum Ass Assistance Clinic to really specifically address the needs of people who can't engage in traditional HIV care. So MAX is a high intensity, low barrier incentivized care model for people living with HIV. It was developed by our, my colleagues in the Department of Medicine, Julie Dombrowski and Matt Golden. Uh, it's just a, a fabulous model that offers walk-in primary care and HIV care, intensive case management, wraparound social services. It incentivizes cash, food, bus passes, people coming for laboratory visits, going to the pharmacy, actually achieving viral suppression. Um, and there's a lot of cross-agency coordination, really tightly linked to the county. So uh, county agencies, jail, data surveillance, uh, other community partners. So it you know, targets the people who are living with HIV who, can't, who are not engaged in care and not virally suppressed. And um, this has been a very successful model. It uh, has very clearly demonstrated achievement in, 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 in helping people achieve viral suppression. It's actually recognized by the CDC as a, um, as a uh, best practice for HIV care. So I got involved in MAX around 2019 when it became clear that there were a lot of unmet, <laughs> it was clear pretty early on, but it became very clear that there were a lot of unmet mental, mental health care needs. And uh, there's a wonderful project led by a medical student that looked at kind of the 227 people who received care in the clinic, vast majority, illicit drug use, diagnosed mental disorders, and a third of them, even if they were referred within the Harborview system, uh, received care. So in 2021, we got an R34 to try to integrate care for depression and opioid use disorder. And it's, again, it's a sort of a similar model. We're sort of bringing in a care manager. In, in our case, it was a nurse because she was also going to be doing Suboxone and, and the, uh, the psych psychiatric consultant. We kind of, what kind of looped us into the MAX care team. And so we had to adapt the model and then we were implementing it, implementing it and assessing just how did it fit? What did people think of it? Looking at outcomes over the first six months. And I want to just reflect on a couple of things that we're learning as we're doing this, because what's different about this than this pilot implementation trial than the, the, compared to a clinical trial is that we incorporated screening. It was everything was clinical care, right? There was no research. It was like everything screening. You have to, so we went from screening, the social workers were primarily responsible for screening, but we trained physicians, the nurse, the public health workers, Anybody who saw the patient should screen them, refer them to the nurse, and then there's there sort of this initial assessment for depression or opioid use disorder. Um, and then the nurse was trained to do behavioral activation, provide Suboxone. We had kind of our usual case review meetings. And what we, what we learned very early on was that there were a lot of barriers to screening. And as we talked to staff, they really, there was sort of clear that there was not buy-in to, there was resistance to screening, either it was a low priority, they sort of didn't see the value of it. When they were busy, it kind of fell to the bottom of the list of things they were doing. But there was this cultural resistance to it. it was, there was a cultural resistance specifically to the validated, you know, the PHQ-9, that they felt like it was a family, it was conversational, and then you suddenly take out this, this form and it was really, it put up a wall. With, uh, and, then, and then this also, this recognition of, gee, we'd like to identify barrier, we'd like to identify, engage people in mental health care, but there's so much else going on for them. It just did not come to the top of the list. Um, and so just as we think about, we're sort of moving to kind of revising this model within Max, we're, spread, we're expanding models to these. There's, there's now five low barrier clinics in King County. We're really, you know, there's quite kind of overwhelming support. People love the idea of having a therapist on site, being able to walk in and talk to a counselor. Uh, what was not so great was the sort of behavioral activation, this, this session-based, manualized psychological intervention. People just read that's not what people want, what the vast majority of people wanted. Um, and then there was also this idea, because of the RFP, we um, uh, had excluded people with psychosis and people who were already in behavioral health care. And there was a lot of resistance that we were excluding people who needed care. So I'm going to end with just talking about our current work of, of, of collaboration with WHO around implementing the model at scale, kind of taking the lessons that we've learned from independent and the MAX trial. Um, in 2019, the um, director of mental health from, from the Mental Health and Substance Use Division at, at WHO kind of reached out to the AIM Center and said, you know, we're convinced about the collaborative care model. We want a manual to be able to, to have WHO have a manual that we can disseminate. 
Um, so Diane Powers, Jesse Whitfield, and I kind of worked for two years to develop this manual, <laughs> this iterative process, talking to a lot of getting case studies from other folks um, at, through an expert consensus meeting, finally they finalized the, our version of the manual in uh, April of 2022. And so now we're excited that WHO recently has obtained funding for a three-year pilot of the manual that are going to field test and evaluate it in NCD clinics in Mongolia, TB, HIV clinics in Ghana, NCD clinics in Dominican Republic, and then you know sort of test it, revise it, should it become publicly available in 2026. So we're sort of middle of phase one, Partners have been engaged. Manuals should be finalized this month. So now we're working on the M&E plan and how to do situation analyses. This summer, kind of moving towards training the teams and launching the program. And then we'll, there'll be sort of evaluation, dissemination of the findings in the manual. So I'll end here saying it's, it is feasible to implement collaborative care in low resource settings. I'm you know, optimistic and confident that it can improve both mental health and medical outcomes, but really, wanting to think about as we move from clinical trials to implementation, it's just kind of a reminder that the implementation process is, you know, it's a process and it's like a long and winding road and that we really have to think about, um, you know, even the most effective models will have limited impact if people don't implement them and they don't reach patients. So we want to think about implementation factors, tailoring to the context, listening to the people who are going to be doing the intervention and receiving it, um, and then thinking about effectiveness, you know, kind of implementation support and strategies for sustainability. So I'll just end with uh, kind of acknowledging all the wonderful colleagues who've worked on this and thank everybody for their attention. Great. Well, Lydia, thank you very much for going through this and going through two um, different and important trials, understanding, helping us all understand recruitment, uh, implementation factors. You had mentioned the independent being a type one hybrid, so, so the uh, implementation aspects built into the trial as well. I wanted to ask Mike, I, I could ask questions all day, Lydia, but I want to see if any participants wrote in questions. Nothing yet. Okay. So anyone who would like to ask a question, uh, please write it into the chat or the Q&A. We do have a couple of minutes um, to, to talk over that. Um, yeah. I can see too if there's anyone in, in the room here that has a question, if anyone wants to pose a question. But I, I also, I guess while people are thinking about it, I'm wondering in the independent trial, um, uh, you know, it, it's interesting to think about outcomes so, so far after the a year yeah. after the intervention. We get a chance to do we that. We don't get a right? chance to do that, but yeah. it's what we all want to think about in mm -hmm. practice. Mm -hmm. um, was, was that uh, sort of deciding on that outcome? Was that was there pushback against that early on? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, and it's a risk, right? It's a risk. Yeah. yeah. And I think we, and we saw it with the diabetes effect too. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so, it's so powerful. And that was something just kind of thinking about, is there something different about the way we approach the management of these conditions that, you know, it's, you learn, you learn enough. I mean, is it the, the you know, kind of the natural course of the illness you, that depression just, you may, you may sustain or... Is there something about the need for ongoing support to sustain that improvement in A1C? I mean, it's just hard to know, right? Uh, I'm wondering, um, just developmentally, Lydia, when you were a fellow, uh, how many trials did you think you would lead? <laughs> <laughs> I, so, and, uh, maybe that's not the right question. Um, and that's, but he, he, I mean, here's a lot of uh, very complicated trials and big collaborations globally and um, I, I yeah, that's uh, the secret, right? Yeah. I mean, it's the collaborations, it's the wonderful partners that um, that create the opportunities, right? And it's definitely a team team effort because it's um, the, it's so especially doing work that's both sort of medically and and mental health focused. So um, yeah, it's just I, I think there's a lot of opportunities, and especially within our department, the Department of Global Health. See, Larry has a, a question. Yeah, thank you. Um, gee, Larry, I don't know. I could ask you the same thing. When yeah. you when do sites know enough about the model to know the questions to ask? And that's a that's a great question. And I think, you know, this idea you're doing a randomized trial. So here's the protocol. You cannot, you know, kind of move from the protocol. You can't, right? Um, but this idea that with these multi-component models, that you have to you do them differently because of like you know the sites. Who's the psychiatrist? Where did the psychiatrist come from? Like, who are the people who are being served? How do you 
provide the same kind of counseling to different people. So I think it, you know, it it's it's just this constant this 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 process that starts very early, and you you observe over time, and particularly outside of a trial, I think this is part of that continuous QI approach. Like, mm -hmm. what are we doing? Is this working? It's like the Max Clinic. Nobody's screening. Why aren't you screening? You know, kind of learning about that. So I think just being really curious, engaging people in examining kind of what's what what you're doing, your processes. And then I think being willing to make changes be willing to make in changes. real time, you know, that's a real departure from other trials where you got to you, you develop a protocol up front and, and you got to stick with that mm -hmm. protocol. And then it gets otherwise it gets very hard to interpret. But with these kinds of trials, oftentimes you're like three months in and it's very clear that, you know, something that you thought was going to work isn't going to work and you just have to make change, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then it creates an analytic challenge that's down the road. But I think yeah. that is how we learn. So I was thinking in the Max Clinic, you know, the people don't want multi-session therapy because otherwise they wouldn't be in the Max Clinic, you know. Uh, for that kind of a setting, you know, the the, uh, the primary care behavioral health model actually might work a lot better. Or you have somebody on site who can respond to anything that a person wants. This idea about you came here and I'm going to give you five sessions of something I want to do probably just doesn't fly for that population, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. And we thought about that. And I think, you know, it's what what is it? There's just something about the presence of kind of a warm, empathic person who can talk to you in the moment about what's on your mind right now, regardless of what dis disorder you might have or the other needs going on. So we're doing some work. A conscious of us wanting to lie. Uh, my colleague is a psychologist in the department and I are doing some work in, in two of the other clinics and just really trying to understand the psychotherapy needs, what kinds of interventions are out there and then how you evaluate them, right? I mean, you can, here's a nice person you can talk to. Is that like, should we pay? Who should pay for that? Like, what is it yeah. helping anybody? You know, so. And so if you, if you get overly, I mean, what we have criticized our colleagues who are doing that primary care behavioral health model, because we've said, you know, you know, it's not real psychotherapy. It's just, you have a nice relationship in the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, uh, if we did the same thing for diabetes, we'd probably never get A1C under control. Mm -hmm. You don't have to, you know, you have to do that. But on the other hand, if you can't offer that nice relationship in the moment, you probably never get to yeah. anything else, right? So I think well, what are, some of the, what are the outcomes that are important? I mean, this is the question we were just asking mm -hmm. yesterday at the team meeting. What are the outcomes that are important? Is it the PHQ-9 or right. is it kind of a feeling of hope, a feeling of social connectedness? Like what ma you know, what outcomes matter to 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 patients and to the providers? So, yeah, yeah, that really influences what uh, treatment decisions you you think about. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, uh, I well, uh, we I don't see any more questions. There's a lot of <laughs> my yes, fan yes, club yes, is responding. <laughs> so, <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, so I think you know here we are at one o'clock, and I I, I want to thank Lydia. Again, for giving this lecture uh, here. Thank Bobby for being present uh, as, as well. And uh, with that, I think we can conclude uh, grand rounds for today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.